Hello, everybody. Welcome to MHTV. We're really happy to have you with us tonight. We're talking about a subject close to all our hearts and one that's really important. We're talking about reclaiming some mental health education, where we are at the moment, where we're heading to, and actually the real importance of making sure that we get there. So we want to hear from you. We want you to join in. Um, before we get to that point, though, let me pass over to Vanessa, who can tell you how you can do that. Vanessa? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, hoping that you'll join in tonight's conversation. As always, you can join in one or two ways. You can join in on Twitter just by typing in the MHTV hashtag, making sure you include that in your tweets and we'll feed that into the discussion. Or if you prefer, head over to Facebook and you just need to like the Unite MHNA page. You should see the live feed pop up there. And there's a dialogue box. Please do ask questions. We want tonight to be a lively discussion and I'll be monitoring social media and um, bringing any questions into tonight's chat. OK, Lovely. I'll hand you back over to Nikki. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We're not all Timely. getting coffee. I hope everyone knows that. Timely. Yeah, where's mine? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's ask our fantastic guest to introduce himself. So Dan, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Dan Wander and I'm a lecturer in mental health nursing and been heavily involved in some mental health deserves better noise making. Um, and I'll hand over to Stephen. Hello, yes, yeah, so I'm Stephen Williams. I'm known as mental health nurse lecturer on Twitter. Um, and I'm a lecturer at the University of Bradford. Um, and I've been getting a bee in my bonnet lately uh, alongside Dan about the state of where nurse education is mm. and what we can do to make it right. Absolutely. Perhaps we should start off just by clarifying what the issues are. So I'll maybe try and give a bit of an overview and please anyone chip in if I do forget anything. So I think Future Nurse Standards introduced 2018. Um, over the coming years, mental health nurses seem to get together and notice, hang on, there's not a lot of mental health in our mental health nursing programs anymore. Uh, there's a rise in genericism um, and a real sort of frustration for academics, for students and for kind of clinical staff as well, feeling there was a rise in sort of a lot of physical health skills that didn't necessarily seem that relevant to the role. And at the same time, that had been sort of put into programs at the expense of more probably a uh, mental health specific, particularly sort of relational content that would have been very, very useful. Um, a bit of noise was made about this through sort of Mental Health Deserves Better, a bit of a kind of subgroup of Mental Health Nurse Academics UK um, met from the start of January last year, 2022, and this year, February 21st, uh, 2023, released an open letter uh, to the NMC and others uh, essentially kind of laying it on the line and saying this isn't good enough for mental health nursing. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if I've forgotten anything else, but that feels like it. I think that's really good, really good summing up. So we've got to the stage where um, this curriculum, which shapes how all nurses across the country are taught. And is that the same in, in Ireland and Wales and Scotland as well? Or do we have just in, in England this issue? So I think from my perspective, it seems to be uh, across the entire UK that mm. there is this. And, and there's, a, I guess, important to note that there's a, a variation between universities. You know what I mean? So universities, yeah. they're maybe sort of 30, 40 miles apart, can be doing very, very different things. Yeah. Um, and I think it's like if universities being given flexibility to develop their own courses, like that's, you would think of that as quite a, a sort of nice thing. But I think the degree of flexibility has been that you go to different universities across the country, you get a different depth yeah. and understanding of mental health education. But I think the problem is this links to a professional register. So you have yeah. a very different depth of education and then everyone gets the same degree and the same point on the, the mental health, the NMC register at the end of it. Yeah. And that just feels a bit messy and disingenuous, I think, from my perspective, if somebody's not getting that much mental health, but is still ended up registered as a nurse mental health. Mm. So for people who don't understand how sort of curriculums happen, how sort of the menu of what you get taught happened is the NMC, who are the governing body, make a list of the things that has to be in education. And then each of the universities interpret that in their own way. So if the team who are building the curriculum are skewed in one way, so maybe more people have an adult background, they tend to create, without even necessarily realising, um, a, a 
a story of what being a nurse is like, which is quite different. So the reason there's so much difference between the universities is because of the skills that people have, because of the backgrounds they have. And that's well and good to a point, but you can't always see whether you're getting um, taught in mixed groups or in field specific groups. You can't always see um, how your skills are going to be supported. Um, and you can't always see how much of the of the content that you're getting taught is actually about mental health rather than being sort of like a what's described as holistic education, but is actually very mental health focused, very biomedical. And that's the real concern, I think, that's that's happening. So for anyone who's like, what is going on? That that's what's going on. And it means at the end, you've got people who have very different skill levels and very different confidence levels, and mm -hmm. also who are maybe less plugged into the kind of emotional experience of being a mental health nurse that kind of like family of nursing that we have created all of them very different because they serve different populations and different purposes so you get you were saying that sort of noise is being made about this and we've got to a stage where um some of the bodies have been approached about that and um, with the open letter has there been any feedback on that because that seems to me a very public gesture no uh so i'm rely i'm reliably informed that the nurse and midwifery council have noticed it and they are working on a response mm. although i've got no sense of when that's going to be i mean i think we'll probably mm. keep uh, reminding them on twitter every now and again that they're due a response i mean really mm. really look forward to that mm. uh, i mean i think certainly anecdotally from the mental health deserves better group we do hear from people in universities across the uk that say that within their universities they are it is being noticed that, oh, hang on, mental health has not been addressed as it should be. Mm. And we recognise this widespread dissatisfaction. Um, I think for me, there's still an issue in that this was able to happen under the future nurse standards. So actually the system allowed this to happen. So mm. there's a problem with the system and uh, that might be part of where we go with this conversation. We tear that all down at some point as well yeah, and make yeah. that better. Yeah. I guess another thing as well is, is it's not just kind of like defending the professional understanding of mental health nursing, but it's also like even after the pandemic, there doesn't seem to be enough mental health in the adult and children's areas as well. When you look at the amount of, sort of comorbidity and distress, it's very much one way traffic at the moment. I wonder if Steve, have you got anything that you particularly want to add to that? Oh, so much. <laughs> Get stuck in. <laughs> well, I mean, yes. I mean, there is not enough mental health in adult field and child field, mm. but it's deplorable. There's not enough mental health in mental health mm. because it's now swimming and drowning mm. in what I call adultification, the genericism. Mm. And it is, Dan, you're right. It's, uh, it, it's the way the system has set itself up. Mm. You know, the NMC has been shuffling slowly towards genericism for as long as I have been an academic for the last 15 years and probably 10 years before that, and it's getting closer and closer to it. And naturally, you know, uh, health, higher education has an adult field dominance and that mental health has been the minority mm -hmm. and put those things together. And we now have a mental health nurse education program crisis. It's not fit for purpose and it's not fit for service users, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And this is why we need to radically address it. Um, my worry is, is that because of these organisational constraints, I think higher education lacks the imagination mm -hmm. to know what to do with nurse education curriculums. That isn't a recycling of where we've been churning through revalidation and re-curriculum design for for well uh, for at least for the last 10 years of my experience of being an academic mm. we we need to get creative and mm. think different for so that we can provide service users with the care that they desperately need mm. which i'm afraid i don't feel that nurse education at the moment provides um professionals Mm -hmm. rightly equipped with the skills mm -hmm. to do that at mo at the moment what skills would you like to see that you think are, are, are not being addressed in the way they should be well oh we're really opening up a keg of worms there but <laughs> um uh, amongst other things um i think mental health nurses need to be able to hold their ground and provide 
um, one-to-one -one compassionate care and time with service users and listen to their needs and not immediately reach for all of the trappings, the task-oriented trappings that bog um, us down in clinical practice and also need to have the critical reflexivity, reflexivity mm. to understand complex issues about risk, the Mental Health Act, and how, how those interact and how we see people and even challenge some of the staid ideas that we have, like the therapeutic relationship, mm. which I feel is uh, has this tint of professionalism and boundaries, mm. you know, that isn't about human connection with mm. people who may or may not be suffering. Um, whose problems are located structurally and mm. affect them personally, that strike at their identity, that mm. stigmatizes them. Mm. You know, there's a lot of skill in being able to sit with people and work with that, with them. Mm. But we have, we're, we're, but nursing students often, I hear them saying, oh, I meant to spend quite a lot of time with the service users. What a shame I'm not going to be able to do that when I'm a professional. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'll have to stop ranting for a minute. <laughs> I was, like, we can there's... come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I've got loads more. <laughs> the real relational skills. Oh. That's what's missing at the moment. Oh. I think we've lost sight of mm. what really um, characterizes, to my mind, mental health nursing. Yeah. It is working within a relationship and the complexities within that. That's at the heart of what we do, yeah. is how we relate to the people that we're working with, ourselves, the yeah. environment, mm -hmm. other members of staff. And we've lost that, lost mm -hmm. sight of that um, in the race to um, address, you know, in the race to medication management, in mm -hmm. the race to psychological therapeutic skills like cbt and dbt and running groups and technical approaches mm. we've lost the heart we lost the soul which yeah. is the relationship mm. i'm sorry i cut you off yeah no no that's fine i mean it just on your last point there Stephen. i think that like we have ended up with an education that seems to be focused on things that you can count quite yeah. easily you know what i mean tasks and you can't sort of can't measure that human connection of oh this person how many people felt understood in your presence today you know what i mean we're not sort mm. of ticking off those things and nor mm. nor should we either you know what i mean i think that we have to sort of understand that mental health nursing is fundamentally different to other aspect other uh, other mm. fields of nursing um i mean in terms of the system that's around us i think that's something that we do have to do is we have to be able to imagine a different system you know because i think that w when i was sort of preparing for this conversation there's definitely a bit of right okay what do i think mental health nurses should get in their education all right okay well we've got the nmc standards just now so you start thinking what can we do within that and, mm -hmm. and already it's sort of constraining you and then oh no, and it's got to be three years and like oh what can we do in that so i do think that we have to get much more imaginative in terms of saying this is what we think it should look like. And actually, if that's not fitting into NMC standards, if that is not fitting into university systems, then actually maybe that needs to change rather than us squash yeah. all this stuff in three years. Um, yeah. Absolutely um, really keen on relational stuff being the most important thing. And someone I noted down is actually probably the the sort of bedrock of that for me is like people actually understanding themselves. I mean, I think particularly when we get a lot of very young people coming mm. on to nursing courses and you don't necessarily want someone by the end to, you have a full understanding of who you are as a person because you're going to change, you're going to change year after year, but giving people the tools to be able to, be able to understand their own unique and individual stories mm and be able to understand themselves as that unique individual that can then act as that sort of, you know what I mean, give them that foundation to be able to really, really empathize with others, you know what I mean, because they do have that understanding of themselves. And when I think about self-awareness, I think about the, 
a deep self-awareness in terms of understanding yourself as an animal. You know what I mean? This social yeah. animal that has got all these sort of unconscious and instinctual drives that you won't even recognize. You know what I mean? Why mm. is it that you're maybe sort of driven to go with a sort of group and the way they're thinking at times, even though it clashes mm -hmm. with your values a bit and you're really struggling to say that. Mm -hmm. So I, I would really start with that, a real depth of, of sort of self-awareness. And I think we do have to give, try and give people courage. And I think mm -hmm. definitely huge issues with where you get some of your education in university and you get some of your education in practice and they don't really connect that mm -hmm. well for me. Um, but we want people to come out the other side really being able to say, I'm not really sure about this. I wonder if maybe this isn't the right thing to do um, and actually be able to advocate for people and challenge mm. the systems that they're working in as well. And mm. I, I think that's definitely an issue in that I, I think, oh, this these might, and I've got lots of stuff written down, these might be some of the things that I think a person should have in terms of their education to be able to support people effectively. But the actual care systems that they're going into, there's huge problems with them mm. already. Mm. So at the minute, it might be, how do we educate people for going into those care systems and mm. helping people as far as possible? But I really uh, would, cause, you know, I mean, I think we really need to think uh, much further ahead in terms of how these systems need to be different as well. Yeah, there is, step something, back now. <laughs> there is something very um, worrying sometimes about sending people out qualified into the way things are at the moment it was it was bad in covid but in covid you can almost rationalize it because it was an emergency and it's still an emergency but it's a crisis now rather than a, an acute emergency and i guess the other thing is thinking about how practice needs or what practice think they want has shaped this curriculum as well because i mean I'm, i don't know if it was the same for you guys but for me there was very much a, a feeling that if you could get an all singing, all dancing nurse, you could move them all over the place and it would be fine. And you could get somebody who could do everything like a Swiss army knife, but people yeah. aren't like that. And they don't, you can't get enough skills all round skills in one person that are current up to date and um, safe to, to be able to be all these different things. And also it's not, it's not in people's preference. People are, are have different skills. They have different callings. They have different ways and, and, and communities they want to work with. So you can't just have this generic person that it doesn't work. When I was in Australia working, it didn't work then. And that was probably five years into that system. And they all knew it was a failure and it was a terrible idea. And I find it really sad that seeing that and people who were influenced this must know that Australian nurses want their mental health specialty back. Mm. I find it really strange. Vanessa, have you got any um, thoughts from a more practice background about this? Yeah, no, just really that it's music to my ears, really. I mean, it's the sort of stuff that I, I talk about and get frustrated about. I think, you know, um, the comment about losing the heart and soul of mental health nursing, for me, that takes us to the, the crux of it. We seem to be in this, like, really reductionist culture where unless you can measure things and apply outcome measures to them um, and do, you know, very singular interventions, then um we're not really providing um any effective care to anybody when actually as you say i mean certainly working in prisons you know the, the the connection that you can have with somebody who's in a prison for me is much stronger than any sort of cbt intervention you can offer or any anything else really often it's just being there for somebody when they're distressed and being consistent and as you say you know we're losing that and um and the focus is changing and I'm just looking at all the comments online and, you know, th there aren't any specific questions, but it's clear that everyone's kind of agreeing with what's being said tonight, that the adultification of mental health nursing um, and about how we're kind of having to squeeze into nursing education, the bits that are really important around the therapeutic um, relationship, rather than actually that being, a, you know, focused mm -hmm. part of education. So... I think everyone's agreeing. Somebody's put as well that people don't appreciate how specialised we are, and I think that's true as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. lots of agreement, really. Yeah. Well, there's anybody out there who wants to put forward a different point, tweet now. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, Dan, I think um, I, I, I've, I've had a few ideas about where nurse education curricula could go to try and remedy this. Mm. And the one that I come back to is, do we want to be in the NMC anymore? Yeah. 
I, I, because I, I don't think, unless something radical happens, and I don't see that happening, I can't see a higher education, nurse education, being able to shape mental health nurse education in the way that we as professionals want, and I think services deserve, that yeah. will work with what the NMC envisions. Yeah, no, I, I would certainly go along with that. I mean, I think that you get a lot of people that end up working in universities that actually they're, and it can be rewarded actually that people are ultimately become administrators um, and they don't necessarily require imagination and they don't need to necessarily think about human beings that are going to be receiving um, care based on the, the education that these people have had. So I do think there will be, while we do have the NMC linked to universities, there will probably be a very unimaginative mapping of here's that standard this is where that's taught that relates to that learning outcome yeah. and it absolutely will lack that and i mean certainly <laughs> i've been i i've considered sort of taking that even one step further but probably kind of relates to what you're talking about in terms of are is the word nursing getting in the way of mental health nursing as we understand it actually developing its own autonomy and and i like when you say that, oh, maybe we're not going to be nurses anymore, like normally people are like, oh, oh, you know what I mean? People get really attached to that sort of nurse title. And actually, when I think about what mental health nurses do when they do it well, I think that is nursing. I think mm -hmm. like if I was to think of that as a, you know, I mean, you're doing word. I think that's what you're doing. I think you're doing that mm -hmm. nursing. But if the NMC have essentially owned that word nurse to the point where nurse means adult nurse mm. then it might have to come to that point so i would absolutely consider uh that we might need to step away from the nmc i mean it, i think with the open letter i think the ball is kind of in their court to kind of show us that they've listened and that they're paying attention and that they mm. um are taking it seriously mm. but i I'm, I'm not being convinced to this up until this point mm. Mm. It's interesting to see where the mandate comes from for something like the NMC as well. So what makes one group of people think that they can just ignore a big section of everybody else who are whose primary goal is to make patient care the best it can be? And I think they've got this far with it because people haven't really understood how this has happened or what's happened. And I think it's an, it's an interesting one because when we had... Um, uh, in, uh, a session where we spoke to colleagues in in the Australian colleges about how this how they came to lose their specialty it was it was by degrees there wasn't anybody setting out to do something awful it was what makes sense what streamlined what and, and none of it was was malign particularly it was just people taking the path of least resistance till the point it didn't exist anymore um, and I know it can sound alarmist but if we look and see how our colleagues in learning disabilities have been treated it's really clear that the smaller numbers you've got the smaller voice you have and the harder mm -hmm. it is to make sure that your profession has visibility then people don't join you because they don't know you're there and then you get pushed around and then you get to, you just you lose your identity you lose your voice you lose your ability to influence things in the way that you need to to protect and support and work for the population in this case learning disability and it happens just not just to mental health but I think Co uh, colleagues in children's nurses feel it too sometimes so this preponderance of the of the curriculum just pulling in a completely different direction with different needs all the time it is it is hard to see how breaks going to be put on something though because it's so fragmentary so on top you've got like a monolith who's ignoring everybody and then the impacts are fragmented through all the different universities so until I think people come together and make a big change it's it's not going to be easy to hold i guess that's where sort of mental health deserves better comes in a little bit i wonder if you could talk about that yeah i i mean well it's something i've thought for a while as well mm. is that like you could think about the nmc as essentially like nursing government or something mm. like that but you think about westminster government at least they've got an opposition mm. <laughs> you know what i mean at least they've got mm. someone that might not be doing as good a job as I would like in terms of challenging the government, you know what I mean? But um, at least they do have that opposition, whereas it feels like the NMC kind of just steamroll sort of through everything. And by the time it gets to mm. sort of universities, you're like, oh, oh, what, wait, what, what are we doing? You know mm. what I mean? This is, this is what's happening. So I, th I think the, the mental health deserves better. It, it probably, 
I guess speaking personally for a minute, you know, I mean, it probably got me at a time where, you know, I mean, you sometimes hear about the state of clinical environments and the poor care that people do experience that we know, we know about panorama and stuff like that, yeah. but we know that things like that are not necessarily uncommon and that might be a sort of extreme end of the spectrum, but people do experience good uh, poor care as well as good care at times. Yeah. I was feeling sort of really quite sort of disillusioned actually in many ways uh, with mental health nursing, but actually um, connecting with other people through mental health deserves better it's kind of sort of lifted me again and actually inspired me connecting with other sort of mental health nurses that I can see really share that sort of same understanding of what it could be and mm. like have a bit of imagination, have a sort of shared set of values. And I think it's definitely something that uh, as a, you know, I mean, COVID was a nightmare, but what it did push us to do very quickly was all go online. So even doing something like this was kind of, it would have been a bit odd a couple of years ago, yeah. uh, but now it's very, very normal, but it allows us to connect. So I really think that we should do not necessarily mental health deserves better, but as a profession, mental health nurses need to be properly connected and properly united to a degree. I think there's always going to be areas where people disagree in general, and that's okay. But I think that unless we stand together, we will be completely steamrolled um, and dominated and we, we won't have a say uh, whatsoever. And I think it was the mental health deserves better stuff was just like, let's have a pop. You know, what I mean, I'm really annoyed and like I'm tired not doing anything about it. And I think that in a variety of different avenues, you know, what I mean, we need to come together and try and actually take to, you know what I mean people get me in trouble for battle language and stuff like that but we need to take the fight to the NMC we need to take mm -hmm. the fight to all these things because otherwise it nothing will change you know what mm -hmm. I mean it just won't mm -hmm. uh, and like you say uh, Nikki it's, it's by degrees you know what I mean and actually the success of these things is largely due to kind of apathy and people feeling yeah. quite defeated in it all which I understand as well mm -hmm. I mean I wouldn't I don't even mind having conversations with people who disagree with me I, I welcome that but it's the it's the nothing that I think is really sad. Mm -hmm. I find really worrying. So, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about how people can join in with Mental Health Deserves Better? Oh, I think you'd be asking Dan that question, but okay. he's got a hashtag, right? MH Deserves Better. <laughs> ah, go on. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, um, so there's a Twitter, there's at MH underscore deserves bet, B -E double t because the better didn't fit in so mental health deserves better without the er on the end uh, there's an email address which is mh deserves better at hotmail.com uh, you can email that if you want to be involved in meetings or, or anything else like that um, yeah. it's a very sort of grassroots movement of people coming together connecting and uh, sort of all going off and doing various uh, projects all with a sort of shared aim of trying to improve mental health nurse education hmm. Absolutely. I can see we've got some um, some people commenting away. I wonder if Vanessa, you'd like to bring those forward. So Maxine yeah. and Michael. Yeah, I was just reading um, the one from Hazel Powell, actually, which is saying, um, yes, absolutely. We need to recognise and celebrate the unique contribution of mental health nursing. But we are definitely part of the nursing family. Mm. So I've got that comment. Um, and then on facebook i'm just going on to it now <laughs> well, you've got a few now haven't we on facebook yes yeah, so we've got maxine louise who's put um we've ended up with a task orientated tick box in education and clinical mm -hmm. practice that we're um trying to cram in basically all the most important elements into not much time which is what we were saying mm -hmm. before wasn't it um and then a comment that's created a bit of conversation and um that saying curriculum cluttering is a real issue the evidence-based practice drum is banged banged more often than that for evidence-based education so that's an interesting one um and then yeah we've generally got a lot of support really for what we've already been talking about really so I think those two in particular are interesting about whether we should still be part of the nursing family as much mm -hmm. as we're reclaim what mental health nurses do and really about the evidence-based practice drum, which I think is, you know, captures what we've been talking about, doesn't it, anywhere? I think that's a great point about evidence-based practice, because <clears throat> we don't do it in education and we barely do it in clinical practice, in my opinion. And, yes. and allow me to validate that. Yes. Good evidence-based practice would suggest that 
our nursing curriculum should be co-produced. And I don't mean that there should be a service user carer group <laughs> who come in to do a few interviews. And, and, and I mean that they're with us from day one in helping yeah. design the curriculum and deliver the curriculum. Uh, we already know that. Um, and yet I don't see any higher education institute at the moment in the UK, my, our own included, as of yet, knowing how to do that. Yeah, I agree. But I think the, the sort of co-production, co-creation of evidence-based practice, you know, we've been talking about this for years and years and years and years now, at least a, a decade or more. And still, oh. as you say, you know, people are brought in to kind of tick off something that's already been created by a group of professionals yeah. and people still don't get what involving people is all, all around and you know it doesn't seem to matter you know how much discussion how much is written about it how much patient you know patients themselves have a voice in saying that they want to be more involved it doesn't seem to shift does it within the culture it's still exactly the same I mean of course yeah. there's elements of good practice going on but I think that Overall, the culture, ha for me, hasn't particularly shifted that much in the last decade mm -hmm. or so, other than the rhetoric of talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's cultural inertia, isn't there, sort of like, Vanessa? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's um, the culture feels kind of like safe with what it does already. It knows it's not right. Yeah. And it ought to be doing something different, but that's scary. You don't want to change that kind of stuff. We can just... You know, and then there's all these mechanisms like, you know, uh, in higher education, we serve the local trust because they uh, are um, in need of our nursing students and they provide the clinical practice experiences. We serve the NMC because they dictate to us what we should put in our curriculum, although they don't specify what that is. They give us sort of like headings and then we puzzle it out from there. We serve the students and we serve the university. We have all these masters to try and sort of like satisfy. And so much gets lost in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd dearly like to be able to see um, a university where, for example, coming in to do my nursing curriculum involves me coming onto campus and finding that there's service users there and clinicians um, working and showing and, and, and delivering Mm. You know, sort of like well-being oriented recovery oriented you know sort of like therapeutic um sessions and uh, i'm i'm coming along as a student to experience that myself firsthand so i can work on myself that then pointed out you know mm. we have to practice what we would like to preach where and that we work alongside and and that would be happening on campus mm. and then that could be taken you know then that could operate as a hub and that um, the uh, clinical practice sort of like is, is, is related to that because it spokes and we could have, say, early intervention services coming in to deliver sessions and students mm -hmm. being involved in that. So you real, we'll bring clinical practice into nurse education directly. And I've done little pilot bits of that in the past and it can work, but there's so much fear and anxiety about what that would really look like. I think there's a real fear of asking people what they really want because what they really want might be very different from what's being offered. Yeah. I mean, you have this misuse of the word co-production where well, what they mean is <laughs> yeah. some some level of participation. Because if you said, would you like to make a list of the things that you think a mental health nurse needs to be able to do? Peg feeding is very unlikely to be on it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's much easier to teach those physical skills in a simulation suite and have them ticked off than it is to sit down and figure out with a diverse group of students who they are and how they can look inside themselves and how they can see what's their problem and what maybe they can support somebody else with and then think about really complex group working or something like that that's hard to teach mm -hmm. and that's why I think there's some anxiety around it and, and it's an emotional thing isn't it you know I think that's the other thing it's not just about logic it's about what people feel as well so Mike Ramsey said, I'm, I'm pretty wedded to my nursing provenance. Being outside would hurt me symbolically. And I can absolutely understand that. But it's that yeah, I, loving something that doesn't love you back, isn't it? You can do it. It's not a great I, idea. <laughs> I'm proud of I'm proud of my nurse identity. I love yeah, being too. a mental health nurse. Mm. But it doesn't love me back. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah. do I need that? It's like it's like uh, it's it's like I'm I don't know I'm in a toxic relationship with my own professional identity. Who you're also well, paying to be registered with? <laughs> yes, think, like, I've uh, I've had that conversation with Mike before, so I'm, I'm pleased he's raising that again. But I think yeah. the you know I mean I'm I'm certainly I, I'm proud of my mental health nurse identity as well. But I think being able to provide effective and appropriate care for human beings is more important to me yeah. than that i think that eric mazel sort of writes about that and the idea that actually all professionals to a degree are attached to our professional titles and we all have a degree of ego in there as well uh, mm-hmm. and i think that's absolutely you know i mean if i i did some training today and i was like i'm a mental health nurse i'm a lecturer i'm a mentalization based practitioner you know i mean you reel off all these titles and there's a bit of ego there and I think that for me, letting go of the nurse title is not something I want to do. It's not something I want to kind of really promote, but it's almost a sort of like in case of emergency break glass kind of type of thing. If we cannot mm-hmm. get a decent degree of autonomy and end up with an education that mental health nursing is satisfied with, then I do wonder if that might be somewhere that we need to go. But um, I don't want to go there, Mike, not yet. <laughs> Mm-hmm. we've got some questions from mushtag have you got those um, vanessa yeah i'm just looking at it mushtag's put sorry i arrived late so i'm sure if this has been answered what would you like to be covered that is not already covered in the uk mental health nursing curriculum do you have a mental health nursing education from abroad that you would want to strive to and what would you change in placements so what would you like to be covered that's not already covered? And would we like what would we like to learn from overseas? And then, and then placements. We did yeah. the first one already, Mr. Egg, so if you rewind, you'll be able to see that. <laughs> but what about mm-hmm. um and uh, abroad? Is anyone doing anything that's copyable or replicable for us? I mean, like I, I don't want to mm-hmm. pretend that I know more than I do. I'm going to try and model that, like mm-hmm. duty of candor and that sort of uh, honesty around. I'm not entirely sure uh, around what's going on in 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 other countries. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not one entirely of the last sure places that. to have mental health separate education. So I think I, mm-hmm. I, the last I saw, I thought it was somewhere in Canada had it as well. Parts of Canada have it as well, but generally speaking, most people don't do mental health until they qualify and then they have tests higher. I mean, it, I guess it is it's certainly worth pointing out. Like I, I spoke to a guy from uh, Belgium, actually, that was talking to me about uh, how UK nurse education is often the envy of other countries because we yeah. do have these specialist fields. Uh, but I think at the moment we've almost got the illusion of specialist fields because that's kind of gradually uh, disappearing day by day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would you what would you change in placements? Oh, well, where do you, I mean, where do you start with that? I mean, I think a deep what, breath. One of the one of the I, I get I do get really frustrated with the disconnection between mm-hmm. theory and practice. And and there's there's something to be valued about people having lots of experience. I think you get a lot from that, but there's something to be valued from contemporary education you know what i mean sort of things that are reasonably fresh and how do you bring those two things together and sometimes i think actually the people that i'm educating i sometimes think that maybe they need education actually not as much as these people that have been doing it for 30 years maybe these people that have been doing it for 30 years maybe they need that so i would like to see much more of a bridge where I can maybe go into a hospital and actually put on an education session for students and clinical staff you know, I mean, that's in not patronizing in any way, but it's like, right, so this is contemporary evidence. How does this match with what you're doing? Um, and and that might actually help us support students that maybe get taught one thing in a university and then go into practice and then get told, that's not what we do here. That's idealistic or, you know, I mean, that's not what we're going to do. And actually, if we're maybe there's a, a visible presence from academic staff, it might actually support students to say, actually, well, you were at that thing that I was and Dan said that, you know what I mean? So I'm not making it up. It, it, it might help. But certainly a bridge between the two is is essential. Yeah. Um, there's a huge problem in that, like, staff teams are on their knees. You know what I mean? There's not enough resources. Mm-hmm. People are, and I think this is across the UK, and I know this is across the UK because I've spoken to people, just put on placements for the sake of hours mm-hmm. rather than this is a quality learning experience. 
um, and they're not necessarily getting good learning. They're not necessarily being well supported. So there's huge systemic issues that I think need to address there. I would certainly say that the 2,300 hours to, uh, that uh, are sort of stipulated by the NMC for, I'm not entirely sure for what reason. I'm not sure why it's the not. The EU regs, which we don't need anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I would like to see a lot of those things looked at. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. What you're saying about the theory practice gap is interesting because I also think there's an issue around nurses working in practice are in a really good position to um to develop practice and be involved in research but often lack the skills and have become disconnected from that so I think as well as bringing education to practice it's also about skilling up our nurses who work in practice to have those research skills so that they can develop practice because there's such a gap isn't there between what happens in academia and what happens in practice and then translating from um, academia into practice which you know as we all know takes years often and um, mm. if all oh, so yeah we're getting absolutely tons of questions in now so shall I ask you three some <laughs> <laughs> so um Mushtag said transcultural mental health nursing anti-racism training and a short placement with social workers and amps is something I would like to see added well, do I yeah. that's a good idea yeah you've got you've got three lots of nodding from that uh, Alfonso, hello Alfonso, says uh, in terms of Europe, I would say it's the other way around. EU countries could learn from the UK. Um, Mike said not being loved back argument is um, compelling, but I remain unsure of who would sanction an out of uh, NMC standalone profession with the power the NMC wields. So perhaps we can come to have a look at politics again in a second. And Daniel said, um, I'm currently a third year student with a certain amount of proficiencies in my practice assessment documents that I have to achieve that are in stark contrast to what my lecturers do purely because they're centered around adult nursing. So I think you've got that kind of like, why, why am I being taught this? Yeah. You shouldn't be buying something if you don't know what it's for. And that goes double for like, if you're spending nine grand on education. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So yeah, a few, a few issues there. I think we can, we're going to be getting towards the end now because we've already been going 45 minutes for a little chat. So I guess it's time to think about, is there anything that, we haven't had a chance to talk about that we really need to get out there now. Stephen, can you think of anything that you wanted to say that you haven't had a chance to say yet? Dan, how do you fancy being a social therapist instead? <laughs> I'd, need, I'd need to think about that. I'd need to look at the terms and conditions of that role and what that, that means. I mean, like, well, It doesn't exist yet, but it's something we could do. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was thinking about some Eric Maisel stuff as well. He he wrote about um, human experience specialists, which I sort of joked with students. It sounds like someone that's kind of walking around puffing a joint saying that they've lived. Um, you know what I mean? So um, I do wonder about the connotations of that. But like, I, I really think that there might be something in that. You know, I mean, um, when I think about the most important things that we do in terms of human connection, you know, I mean, I'm not sort of necessarily completely anti-medication and things like that i think these things have definitely got a place in some kind of way um but yeah i i i would definitely consider that and i would definitely talk more about that and how about it vanessa just as a as a quick reaction how would you feel about being with the social work family instead of the nursing family yeah i don't know i'm quite wedded to my nursing identity <laughs> But I do, but at the same time, I do kind of get where you're coming from about nursing. Mm. Um, I just don't know if we, you know, removed ourselves from the NMC, then we become mental health practitioners. And in a way, we're genericizing ourselves with other mental health practitioners. And I, I think the different disciplines of mental health are all offer different things. So, you know, occupational therapy and social work as who work in mental health offer something slightly different to what mental health nurses do so my concern would be they're in some ways whilst we're removing ourselves from the adult nursing community mm. we're genericizing ourselves within the mental health community so that's what I'm thinking about for an off the, off the cuff quite answer that's pretty good I thought <laughs> um, Dave's joined in as well now I'll put his own questions in Hello, Dave. um thank you very much we didn't recognize you were here today but you are so um obviously like always and um, when they discussed the standards we asked newly qualified mental health nurses how long they thought they'd maintain competency in their nursing procedures most of them expected to lose them quite quickly 
Mm-hmm. It's true. And Maxine says, um, mental health nurses, we know, are often un- unable to get competencies signed. And Alfonso said, um, if, we're, if we're rewriting the curriculum while we're at it, let's put in some more EDI, particularly around LGBT uh, plus yeah. mental health. Mm. So, any comments on those various random points? I think a sort of intersectional approach to mental health is increasingly needed, particularly if we're talking about, you know, working with human beings and humanising mm. mental health. I think, you know, kind of understanding the, mm. the different layers of oppression that people experience and the different aspects of people's identity, mm. rather than kind of just looking at race, for example, in mm. a singular way and, and you know, sort of generalising that, um, you know, any woman of colour, for example, will experience mental health services in the same way without taking into account other characteristics. So for me, I do think that's increasingly important and, you know, to certainly understand the inequalities that different communities and different people are facing. So, yeah, so I would agree with that. I think that's one of the strengths of mental health. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're able to talk about things that aren't just medical. So one yeah. of the things I think that we bring to the gen- general conversation are what's the impact of poverty on this person on their, yeah. you know, because you have that situation don't you, where someone's being treated for asthma, but they're going home to a rental accommodation <laughs> covered in black mould. And I exactly. think that that's our link to kind of social work almost and that idea about actually the system a human being lives in makes a difference to their physical and their mental health. And I think we've yeah. always been a little bit more comfortable to be a bit political compared to our sort of um, family members in adult nursing. I definitely agree with that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So we should do some last comments then and round up. Who wants to go first with their last thoughts? Which sounds so frightening. <laughs> I don't mean we're going to, I think bad is going to happen to you. Dan. <laughs> I mean, so, someone that I'd, and we're going to have to do this again, because I've got lots of notes and stuff that we never said, but um, someone that I think that we need to think about in terms of preparing people and someone that we need to get better at as a profession is navigating the pol- political environment. Um, and w- when, I, when I've been thinking about sort of parity of esteem, I think we need to think about, parity of esteem in sort of leadership roles in decision making roles that decide the sort of future of nursing the future of nursing education and really really being be involved in like have a veto at these sort of tables as well you know what i mean saying no if, if mental health nursing is not signing this off you're not going in this direction or you can do that but we need to do something different and actually we need to be able to, uh, i think we do need to be able to prepare our students to be much more assertive than maybe other fields in these, uh, nursing need to be certainly adult nursing because they, there are more of them uh, and their needs are sort of almost look after themselves as a result of being in quite a sort of privileged position just through sheer numbers so mm. I do think that we need to think about how we manage uh, the politics of the nursing world and how we get better at communicating with each other and sort of articulating a shared voice to try and I guess ultimately uh, get the best education so that people can get the best care. Steve? Well, I, I've just been uh, sort of like uh, pondering sort of like Vanessa's remarks, really. Mm. Yeah, I mean, sort of like the, the, the thought, like, you know, I, I say about five years ago, the thought of not being a nurse in that I wouldn't be under an NMC registration. I wouldn't know who I was and that would be scary and I'd feel like I'd abandoned a profession that's given me so much but increasingly these days I'm excited about the prospect of doing something different because nursing doesn't do it for me anymore that maybe actually it's exciting to take back control so the possibility of creating something new I mean what's wrong with forging an alliance with uh, you know a, a different registering body you know healthcare professionals you know, for example, that we could still come under that wing and being able to set out what it is that we do. I get excited about that. I'm nervous about it. But um, uh, I really think we need to forge something different that we, if we carry on just trying to shore up where we are, we'll find ourselves buried, which is a bit depressing maybe, but that's the reality. Very dramatic last image for us. So, so thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> As everyone is shaken to the core. <laughs> Do you remember when I said finish on something positive? Do you remember that? It was like yeah. half an hour ago. <laughs> well, I was offering a route out from being buried then. <clears throat> you must come back, Steve. <laughs> Fair enough. 
Vanessa. Yeah, no, I think for me, um, it's really important that we focus on nurse education. That's where it starts. But I think this, for me, this discussion is much wider than just nursing education. Mm. I think that the the culture of mental health nursing in practice as well, that mm. we're potentially, you know, diluting our identity as well within practice. So yeah. something for me with, the, you know, with the Mental Health Deserves Better movement is about bringing the whole system together. So bringing, you know, nurses in practice together with nurses in education and, um, you know, sort of being stronger together, I guess, mm. because I think it is a... A, a sort of much wider issue than education mm. so yeah that's my reflection so a couple of last minute under the wire comments there so one from daniel saying i appreciate the need for parity of team but we're specialized for a reason um um mike as well has said um mike has said um bateman and tyra in 2004 so someone pulling out the aged references they're well done and was talking about how mm -hmm. Even in those days, it wasn't equipping the, the standards of education weren't um, equipping people to work with complexity. And we just moved even further away from that than we were before. So a lot to think about. Did you just do a little tick? Yeah. There? I did. I was just ticking that. I marked that. <laughs> <laughs> seminal <laughs> reference <Yeah. laughs> Hazel Powell um, this would be such a backward step we need um, nurses to have competence in mental health we always need specialists like we need specialists in lots of other areas uh, without specialists we um, reduce positive air outcomes and increase safety issues and Yasmin said we should have more trauma focused nursing ACEs and their impacts on people bang right um, and also basic foundation in the most common mental health um, conditions including personality disorders or personality issues or attachment issues which is absolutely true it's almost as if we teach the um things we're most confident to teach and then all the rest mm. a bit back um dave's also said you know, this is your last chance to join in dave and um, that he's also um been um talking with the nmc to make sure they properly engage in this debate including at the last council meeting so you know whilst um i think the stuff that goes on behind the scenes with people we don't always know is happening. So thank you very much for that on behalf of Unite. Um, next week, we've got fantastic guests talking about long COVID and how the condition affects mental health. We've got do uh, guest Dr. Saika Ibbal and Dr. Mohamed Wakas talking about that what we're starting to understand about the kind of emotional and psychological impact of what's been very much focused on physically so far. So again, the point of the <laughs> point of us is uh, really demonstrated yeah. there. Thank you so much to our fantastic guests, lively, entertaining as ever, and talking about something that's <laughs> really, really important. So very, very much appreciated, guys. Thank you very much. And for you, you as well for joining in. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.